Thanks for watching. I'm Andreas. I'm based in Zurich. And on the other side of the ocean, there is... I'm, I'm David, and I'm based in Philadelphia. We actually met not in a musical setting. Uh, and then uh, Andreas just casually told me, well, I'm a conductor and a pianist. And I said, wow, I mean, that's great. I, I'm, just, I'm just a fan, you know? So, <laughs> and, and that's how this conversation started. What we thought we were going to do today was tell you three stories uh, which we think are interesting and the the relationship between them is that these are stories about unusual events or circumstances without which we would not be having some of the greatest masterpieces today so that's that's kind of the, the thread that binds the three stories that we're going to tell you about and shall we start yes let's let's start do you guys know what is the most watched piece of classical music on YouTube? Give Let me guess. No, of course I know, but I, I no. think the normal answer no was something of Mozart. No Bach, no Beethoven, no Mozart. Check it out. It's this one. Vivaldi's Four Seasons, most requested piece of music on YouTube and probably one of the most recording pieces of music ever. And what's amazing about it is that for over 200 years, nobody heard that piece of music being performed, which is really mind boggling. And, and it, it's, it's an interesting story. So, so Vivaldi died in 1741. He was a Catholic priest. He died alone, kind of broke, uh, left a bunch of cases of manuscripts, uh, which found themselves in a convoluted way, separated and then reunited in the, the monastery near Turin. And then in 1926, so 185 years after he Amazing, died. Amazing, no? Amazing, and, really. Uh, yeah, and all this time, it, none of his pieces were published or performed, completely forgotten. So 185 years later, the, the monastery decided that they wanted to do something with this, you know, cases of stuff. And they brought them to the National Library in Turin for evaluation. And luckily, they, they, they reached the hands of a Dr. Bartolomeo Gentili, who was a accomplished musician. And he looked at that and said, oh, shit. <laughs> Actually, he deserves also a medal. I mean, think of of him not being so so knowledgeable and so right. you know detective like instinct <laughs> then sure. uh, yeah which is why we mentioned his name right yeah, yeah. You know, no uh, so so he he figured well this is a real treasure mm -hmm. and he wanted the, the library to own own the manuscripts not sell them eventually they got sold to a noble man who who donated them to the library, but not all of them. Then some other piece was like somewhere else, and then they ended up donating it. All, all this happened like from 1926 until 1949, mm -hmm. where these manuscripts were, were reunited and cataloged and learned. And the very first performance was not until December 31, 1947, right? Amazing, Louis Kaufman, no? Louis yeah. Kaufman performed a portion, a portion of the Four Seasons at Carnegie Hall. That also seems to be part of the story that Vivaldi's music, although very, very famous, very much requested during his lifetime, 
So towards the end of his life, sometime he fell out of fashion because, of course, if you if you think like 1741, that's already you know the transition from from baroque to to classic. So then it could easily be that somehow this music you know wasn't wasn't fashionable anymore. So people stopped playing it, and yeah, that's it. And I mean, also one thing to always remember is. I mean, we today, as you said, as we're discussing, I mean, we talk about music that is, you know, more than 200 years old. And we, we keep playing such pieces, you know, and even Beethoven is, is more, <laughs> more than 200 years old. And, and, and so the, the, all the rest, I mean, but in those days, they, they, uh, people, so the, even the ordinary audience would have been insulted had you played to them two times or three times the same piece. They always wanted to hear something new. So, I mean, it was completely unthinkable that a composer would present himself in a, in a new concert or at a new location in a, in a new country, wherever, with an old piece. They always had to write something new. It's remarkable, really, not only the Four Seasons, but everything else that he yeah. did was outstanding. I must say, I'm without bragging, but I mean, I, I recently conducted uh, a Vivaldi piece, uh, Nisi Dominus, it's called, and it's it's for alto and, and the string orchestra. And, and I, I really thought of our conversations, earlier conversations, and I again discovered how genius, I mean, this, this music is. It's so simple, it's so, it's so clear, and still it, it, it's sometimes even all, almost minimalist, you know, but it's in the, it, with, the, with the least of means, it's the maximum of effect. Let's move to the next story. Another fantastic composer whose name starts with a V, Giuseppe Verdi. So Giuseppe Verdi, I view the greatest opera composer of all time. He had a tough start, you know, he, he, he really did. He was, you know, strugg typical struggling artist. You know, he, he was rejected by the Milan Conservatory. He had trouble getting commissions and, you know, he finally found a sponsor who believed in him, who commissioned um, three pieces. Well, so actually, he got, he got a he he got one commission which was well well received, and then he got as a result of that a commission to write three operas. And the second opera he started writing was a comic opera called King for a Day. And what happened during the time he was writing it was devastating. Mm -hmm. He had two young children, uh, each of whom died in sequential years at age two. And then his wife died shortly thereafter at age 26. And so his entire family was devastated, was gone in, in a, a span of two years while he was writing this comic opera. And so, uh, not surprisingly, the opera was terrible. It was <laughs> a complete fiasco. I, I read, I mean, also I read it up. I mean, it, and although the, the, the cast, you know, apparently the cast was exquisite. And he was devastated from every perspective and, and did not want to write music anymore. Mm. And so the next piece, so, so the, this impresario, you know, Bartolomeo Morelli, he kept believing in him, he kept chasing him to write another opera. And, and he had this libretto for an opera called Nabucco, uh, which he kept throwing at him and, and Verdi didn't want to have anything to do with it. And, you know, he, he would just like, you know, put it in the trash and Morelli would pressure him again. And, you know, and finally one day, you know, he, he decided, well, maybe we'll give it a shot. And, and, and so what came out of that, uh, is an opera that changed history. Uh, mostly because in it, there is a magnificent uh, choir piece uh, called Vapensiero.
this piece of music, other than being sublime and the words being profound, uh, touched the nerve in, in Italy because it talked about, this, these were uh, uh, Hebrew slaves in Babylon who longed to be free. And at the time, Italy was ruled by the Austrians and there was an, a strong undercurrent of independence in Italy trying to get rid of the Austrians. And, and somehow this music captured the hearts of the Italians. And they would come out of the opera humming the piece. And it became kind of the, the unofficial national anthem of Italy. Mm. And very the independent when, song, so to say. Independent song, that's right, that's right. The, the Marseillaise of... Uh, yeah, 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 definitely, something. And, and again, that's what I mentioned before, you know, there you can see in, 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 a, in a nutshell what this Italian clarity means. I mean, if without being, you know, simple in any way, it's, it's highly sophisticated music and at the same time, everybody can sing it after, after listening to it just once. And that's mm -hmm. the miracle because it's certainly, I mean, never, I, that's something also I learned from many composers. I mean, the, the melodies you hear, and if they sound simple, never, never assume that composing them was as simple as they sound. So, but that's the genius, you know, to, to, to condense one's, you know, imagination being a composer into a, such a melody that is just perfect and understandable immediately. We had Gentili in the first story. We have Merelli, Merelli yeah. in the second story, which without him, basically, we wouldn't be having some of the greatest operas ever written. So here's Gentili and Morelli. Mm -hmm. And now the third story also has a hero. <laughs> this other composer we are going to discuss a little bit is Sergei Rachmaninov, the famous Russian composer, or yeah, let's say of Russian origin and then later exiled. And by the way, some essential element also in his life and in his music is a constant homesickness. I mean, he was always, since being exiled from Russia, he was always homesick. And he tried always to create around him like the, the closest he could, could get to of a Russian, uh, you know, environment. He had Russian, you know, servants, Russian cooks. <laughs> and uh, anyway, but he was, as you know, he was, uh, he, he was not only very and later on a very famous composer, but he also was in the first place a very accomplished pianist. He was really also in today's standards, he, he would be in the, in, on the, in the international top, maybe yeah. even top five, you know, he was so accomplished. Yeah. And, and he, uh, had, he had an advantage that other people didn't have. <laughs> he had humongous hands. Huge hands, huge. huge. And so he would, he would spin, <laughs> and 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 famous pianists today, you know, they, they comment how difficult it is to, to play. Yeah, music. yeah. Their hands yeah, are yeah. not big. It, uh, I mean, it's. I think the Ashkenazi used to say, you know, I wish I had you know, <laughs> ten more centimeters. No, it's amazing. I mean, and of course, it it makes it's it's possible to play his music even with uh, not so large hands, but. It it's simply it's it's much more you know you 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 need much more effort to 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 make sound it effortlessly because if it, that's the point you know if you have huge hands you just lay them on the on the keys and then you have already like uh, ten voice chords and and otherwise you have like to stretch your fingers all the time and it's first of all it's dangerous if you're not trained. And second of all, it, it's much more, you know, demanding to, to sound as effortlessly as it should sound. But anyway, he at one point composed his first symphony and 
again, like the, the Verdi opera, it was a complete fiasco. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, found, I didn't find anything about the quality of the performance, but I suppose it must have been normal, at least average. Well, actually, it was not. It was not. It, it was a good performance or not? It was a terrible performance. It was a terrible performance yeah, also. It ah, was okay. a terrible, and okay. you know why? The conductor was none other than Glazunov. Ah, and he didn't like Glazunov, to Glazunov, ah. and Glazunov was drunk oh, no. out of his mind ah. when he was conducting it. He was smashed. Ah. And so the, the performance was a disaster. Oh, yeah. Okay. In no small measure. Thanks to Glazunov, <laughs> by the way, is a, a great composer. Okay. That was. Bad performance. Also, the critics didn't like the music. And same effect like with Verdi, Rachmaninoff wasn't able to write music, his own music, for another three or four years. So he, he really, he, he, he said, no, I, I'll stop. He continued to perform as a pianist, but he stopped writing music. And then he met, and again, this is also similar to, 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 to Merelli, probably. So he found a family who liked him very much, and he liked his family. And the daughter of this family, by the way, later became his wife. And they decided, you know, this guy is so talented, it can't be that he never will write music again. And they sent him to a psychotherapist named Dr. Nikolai Dahl. And, you know, at that time it wasn't yet, you know, we hadn't Freud yet, so there was not this, uh, you know, uh, special new therapy. But at, in those days they just did hypnosis. So Rachmaninoff went to a few hypnosis sessions with Dr. Dahl and apparently very successful because then he started writing music again, and what came out was this world-famous second piano concerto. And on the on the you know front page of the score, he wrote, he dedicated the piece to Dr. Nikolai Dahl. That's probably also one reason why we know where Dr. Dahl was and what what his effect on Rachmaninoff was. Yeah, he certainly didn't want to didn't, didn't hide it. So. Yeah, and, and the second piano concerto is one of the most beloved pieces mm -hmm. of music ever written. Um, uh, and, I may brag, uh, <laughs> it was first recorded by the Philadelphia Right, Orchestra. you're right, by Stokowski, oh. no. And, and, it was uh, recorded it with Rachmaninoff on the piano. Rachmaninoff himself. Hopefully you enjoy the stories um, and you understand why without them we wouldn't be having some of the greatest music. And you have three unsung heroes, each of whom, you know, most people don't know their names, but made a huge contribution to the history of music. Okay, tune in again. Bye. Mm -hmm.